praise your name this morning. Praise your name, Lord. We worship you. We bow before you, Lord. We lift our hands to you, Lord. We exalt you. We worship you as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods, the creator of the heavens and the earth and mankind. Lord, you are the creator. You are God. We worship you. Your name is above every name, the name of Jesus. We thank you that you're our savior, our healer, our deliverer, our redeemer, and our one true God, the creator. We come to you today, Lord, I ask you to move in this place. I ask you to move and touch those who will be watching and listening all over the country and in different parts of the world today. We pray for your power, your anointing, your truth, and we pray, Lord, that the truth will set captives free, Lord, that you will open eyes to the truth and bring them to repentance and faith in your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead. And we pray it all in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. We welcome everyone to Fire and Grace Church this morning. Those of you here, those watching and listening, boy, do we have a lot to cover this morning. Good to have you guys. Um, we're going to be continuing the series. Like I said, I don't know how long it's going to be, but uh, we're continuing the series on, the. Uh, I guess, the main name is the Sevenfold Doctrine of Creation. So we're working our way down through those seven things. Uh, number one was the shape and the layout of the earth, uh, the firmament, uh, with the, the sun, moon, and stars, of course, the ether and the ends of the earth. Now, some of these we're going to combine. This morning, we're going to talk about the stars. I've entitled this this morning, uh, Deceived by the Stars. Uh, and this is part six of the series. So we're going to get into this this morning, Deceived by the Stars. You're going to find out what that means. Um, but we're just going to jump right into it. Um, let's see if we're working today. There we go. Let's start here. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to read verses 7 through 12. This is talking about the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist. There will be a final Antichrist, a man that will lead a world government. He's going to appear on the scene very soon. And the Apostle Paul began to speak about that. But he said something about this spirit of Antichrist. He said this mystery of iniquity is already working. So the, the spirit of the Antichrist or anti-God, or anti-Bible, uh, or we could say anti-creation. Uh, we could go down through a lot of things, but uh, anti, it just means to be anti the Lord Jesus Christ, anti his truth, his word. Um, but this spirit's working. It says here, the mystery, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, that's the King James way of saying, he who is now hindering it all from happening. God holds back things because it wasn't time fully. And then he says this, verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness. Somebody say, all deceivableness. It means all kinds of deception, right? With all, everything the devil's got, he's going to pull out here at the end times. And he says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, this is the scary part here. And for this cause, because they wouldn't hear the truth, they wouldn't love the truth. What is the truth? The Word of God, the Bible, is God's revealed truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So because they wouldn't receive the truth... It says, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God shall send them strong delusion. Now, what do we mean by that? Is God a deceiver? No, he's not a deceiver. But he will allow the devil to deceive, and he will actually Work that into his plan. For instance, I think about the, uh, there's a passage in Kings, and I now I can't remember if it's 1 Kings or 2 Kings, where it's talking about 
God is speaking, and he's saying, Who will go for me? Who will deceive Ahab that he may go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper? So, see, Ahab was wicked, and God wanted to go ahead and destroy Ahab, and he said, well, I'm going to let, I'm going to allow Satan to deceive him, and so that he will go where he will be destroyed. And so the Bible says a lying spirit stepped forth and said, I will do it. And the Lord said, how are you going to do it? He said, I will go be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. So we go back and we see the picture on earth, and, it's in, and all the prophets were saying, to Ahab, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. And of course, we know what happened to Ahab at Ramoth Gilead. He was struck by an arrow and died there. The judgment of God fell upon him, but God allowed him to be deceived by a lying spirit and actually told the lying spirit, go ahead, go do what you want to do. Well, guess what? God is doing this, and this is particularly about the last days, that God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I believe part of the strong delusion that God himself is sending and allowing is to allow certain things to appear certain ways to these people so they will believe what they want to believe because they didn't receive the truth. So he's allowing them to be deceived by things that appear or they're interpreting to appear in a certain way. And I'm going to explain that as we get into this. But let's continue. Uh, here's... A prophecy from Enoch that I want to read that I think is very pertinent to this, since we're talking about the stars today and deceived by the stars. Maybe we're going to find out what stars are. They're not massive suns and galaxies far, far away. That's a bunch of fairy tale nonsense told by the priest of scientism. But here's what it says here Enoch 80, 6 through 8. It says, And many chiefs of the stars shall transgress the order prescribed. And these shall alter their orbits and task, and not appear at the seasons prescribed to them. And the whole order of the stars shall be concealed from the sinners. Meaning, they won't understand it. All right? And then he says this. And the thoughts of those on earth shall err concerning them. Do you hear that? He's saying the stars are going to fool these people. And the thoughts of people on earth will err because of the stars. Now, you better pay close attention. All of this is going to make sense as we get into this. And it says here, And the whole order of the stars shall be concealed from the sinners, and the thoughts of those on earth shall err concerning them, concerning the stars, and they shall be altered from all their ways. Now, that's talking about the people. Shall, it will cause people to change their ways they will, because they will believe these lies about the stars. All right, let's keep going. And then he says here, Yea, they shall err and take them to be gods. Didn't we hear that from Lawrence Krauss the other day? Forget Jesus, the stars died so you could be here. And it says, And evil shall be multiplied upon them, and punishment shall come upon them so as to destroy all. And uh, if you look at this chapter in Enoch in context, it is talking about the end times. But just remember that, the deception... That's why I entitled this Deceived by the Stars. So let's, let's keep going here. I want to read this, too, because uh, I've got a lot of scripture this morning. Uh, Psalm 96. I, I continue to get emails and comments from Christians. Who knows? Maybe they're trolls. I don't know. But, you know, one guy was going off, why do you even talk about this stuff? I feel sorry for your church. You don't ever preach on salvation. I mean, the stuff people's. The stuff people say, I mean, I think I remember last week telling people how to get saved. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I just don't get it. But let me just show you something the Bible says here. Okay, this is uh, Psalm 96, uh, 1 through 5. Let's read this. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen and his wonders among all the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Isn't it interesting how that always comes back to that? See, what we're proclaiming when we proclaim the truth of creation from the Scripture, from the Holy Bible, 
is we're proclaiming that our God is the God of gods. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the creator. He's, just not, he's not one of some of these lesser gods. He is the God. Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, the Lord Jesus Christ, El Shaddai, his many names. But it always focuses back on he's the one that made the heavens, and we're to declare his glory and his wonders to all the people. All right, so we're to talk about these things according to the Bible. Guess what? It says it again. Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Let's read this. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Well, wait a minute. If he's the creator, part of his deeds are how he created the earth. And the Bible is full of how he created the earth. So this is important. Somebody say, Amen, right? So make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Talk about all his wondrous works. Well, I would think how he made the heavens and the earth very important. Amen? Those are his wondrous works. Uh, there's no other God that can claim that they created the heavens and the earth and be telling the truth. Only the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's keep going here. He says, Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them that rejoice seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his war marvelous works that he hath done. So, I mean, some of these Christians, eh, like we, we, let's throw out the book of Genesis. It's amazing, isn't it? Or, or, well, Isaiah talks about creation. Throw that out, too. Let's throw out the Gospel of John. It just gets old. Remember his marvelous works that he has done, his wonders. So remember them. Talk about them. This is Bible, folks. Sorry. People, you know it's amazing how mad Christians get when you do what the Bible says. I, frankly, I'm tired of Christians. But Pastor Dean, you're a Christian. How are you? Yeah, well, I'm tired of them. <laughs> I'm tired of hard head, stiff neck. I guess I need to. I guess I need to qualify that, right? Stiff neck people. All right, uh, let's get to. Let's go back to Genesis here for a minute, since we're going to talk about his wondrous works. Let's read this again. Uh, we've already covered the firmament, so you need to go back and cover that. But the, the firmament is important. Remember, we've established already the firmament is solid. It is uh, some type of molten crystal glass. We don't know how thick. According to the Bible, above that is water. Um, but let's, let's read this here. Genesis 1, 14 through 19, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, only two great lights. All right. Two great lights, which would mean the stars are lesser lights, <laughs> not greater light. Uh, <laughs> isn't it amazing? Science is always opposite of what God's word is, even in the small details. The devil just can't stand the truth, right? But God made two great lights, and the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now, wait a minute. This is the fourth day. I thought... On day one, what did God say? Let there be light. So there was light before there was the sun, moon, and stars. We won't talk about that light right now. We'll get on that probably next week when we get on the sun. All right? But just think about that for a minute. And if the sun was made on day four, what were we orbiting, spinning, and flying around for the first few days? Ah, nothing. Nothing. And we're still not 
orbiting, spinning, and flying around. Anything. All right, we're going to talk about that in the days ahead, that the earth is still and at rest. Um, just to show you this, God said, listen, can we see the firmament itself? The firmament don't. Can we look up there and see it? No, not necessarily, because we're looking through atmosphere, we're looking through air, we're looking through moisture and humidity, we're looking through, I believe, and we're going to talk about this, a thick ether level as well. We can't actually see the crystal solid firmament dome, but then God says this right here. Now, l listen, let's watch this right here. Can you go ahead and see? See, he said the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well, how does the firmament show anything if we can't see it? Because he set the stars in the firmament. We're going to talk about that. It says in Genesis, we just read that. He set the stars in the firmament. The stars are somehow inside or attached in some way to the firmament. So when you see the stars moving in their courses there, you're seeing what he's talking about, the firmament showing his handiwork. All right? When we see the aurora borealis, or we're, we're seeing the Lord display his handiwork through the firmament, even though we don't see the firmament, but we see what he has put in it. It's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like looking at a, at a forest uh, ahead of you. you. All you see is green trees, and then all of a sudden the lights go out, and one of them just has lights all over. Well, you can't, you know, at night, then you can't see the tree anymore, but you see the what? See the lights he set in it. And so this is the heavens de declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth, reveals his handiwork. So when you're seeing the stars and you're seeing that aurora, you're seeing his glory through the firmament. Now, let's look at this. As I mentioned, I want to give scripture this morning. So we notice here that the, talking about the stars, he says here, and I beheld, this is Revelation 6, 12 through 14, and this is the sixth seal at the very end. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. See, this, this is the scripture that Neil deGrasse Tyson mocks and says, you can't possibly know what those mean. No, you don't know what they mean, Jack Leg. You have no clue. And I'm going to show you, they just make this stuff up, okay, these, that these are massive suns. They haven't been there. They're going to tell me that's a sun out there that twinkles just because it twinkled a little brighter than something else. This is what they base it on, but we'll, we'll get into that more in a minute. But he says here, the Bible says, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as, or like, in similar fashion, as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So the heaven he's talking about here that's going to be moved or unfurled like a scroll, that's going to be cut asunder, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the firmament message. This is the solid firmament, and this is why, this shaking is why the stars are going to fall. But what are they? What are these stars? What are they? We know they're not suns because God made two great lights, and one's called the sun and one's called the moon. And let me, can I just say, that if God made the sun and the moon and the stars, that the sun and the stars are not the same thing. Okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? If we're going to be Bible-believing Christians here, let's believe the Bible. All right? Different word in the Hebrew for sun versus stars. All right? <laughs> it's very clear. They're not the same thing. Um, here's Revelation 1. I'm going to go here. So we're going to answer the question, what are the stars according to the Bible? 
not according to what you've been told in your public school or your liberal college or by your white robe priest of science, theoretical physicist or the, the, theoretical astrophysicist. You know what that is? That's a storyteller, okay? But let's look at what God's Word says. Revelation 1, 10 through 15, the apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Isn't that interesting? Yahweh said, I am the first and the last in Isaiah, and Jesus said, I am the first and the last. So for you hardheads out there, Yahweh is Jesus, God in the flesh. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira, and unto Sardis and Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice was the sound of many waters. And then he says this, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Ooh, don't fall down. Kundalini, right? I fell down as dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be he hereafter. Now, we want to know what the seven stars are, the mystery. He tells us. We don't have to guess. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. Somebody say, the stars. Say it with me. The stars are the angels. I didn't say it. Bible says it. Is there more to it than that? Yes. Revelation 9, we get the same picture. He says, and the fifth angel sounded. This is the, uh, what is this? This is the sixth trumpet here. Or the fifth trumpet, I'm sorry. The fifth trumpet sounds here. And the fifth angel sounded. So these are angels blowing the trumpets. And I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. A star fall from heaven. A falling star? A shooting star? What is this? And then it says, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the pit. So is this some meteor or rock falling to the earth and given a key to open the bottomless pit? No, he says what it is. He says the stars are what? The angels, right? Then we have another reference here, okay? Okay. He says here, given this reference in Revelation 12, 3 through 5, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. We know the great red dragon is Satan. We know that this beast with seven heads and ten horns represents the world government that's followed him, the Babylonian system that's been around for a long time. And then he says this, he's given us a picture. And he says in his tale, the dragon, speaking of Satan, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Well, what do we know about Satan? Who did he draw out of heaven and bring to the earth with him? One third. Angels. Exactly. So here's a reference to angels as stars again. Okay. Let's keep going. Now, here's what's interesting. You say, well, what are meteors and comets and all these different things we see in the sky? Look, I believe when you're seeing shooting stars, falling stars, comets, these lights moving in the sky, and maybe even some of the things they call satellites, you see in a light move across the sky. We'll talk about that more in the days ahead, what satellites really are. But notice that Jesus spoke here. This is Luke 10, 17, 18. In the 70 returned again. With joy, saying, Lord, even the devils or the demons are subject unto us through thy name. 
And Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as or like lightning fall from heaven. Wait, where is heaven? It's up. So what he's talking about is when, when Satan fell, it caused like a streak of light to go down with him down to the ground. All right? The light shows you see. You say, well, how, how in the world does NASA and some of these people predict meteor showers? I'll tell you why. Because they're in league with these demonic forces and Satan and the fallen angels. And they can tell them, we're about to have a fight with Michael and his angels. It's going to be quite a show tonight. It's not really complicated. See, what I'm going to tell you is you're seeing more of God's glory and more, more supernatural going on in the heavens than you really realize. That green aurora borealis, it talks about there is a, there is a green rainbow around the throne we're seeing the glory of god that's why the bible talks about the glory of god is is fills the earth and the people see the glory of god it's not just some metaphor right now isaiah thirteen ten, in the king james bible this is the only place you see the uh translated the word constellations but let's read this for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. This is a, an end time reference. But constellation just simply means what? There's not something different out there. It just simply means a cluster or group of stars. All right? And as you'll see here, the word, um, this is the word for star, so this is kokab, and it just means in the sense of rolling, in the sense of blazing, a star as round or as shining also can be called a prince. Isn't that interesting? All right, so that's the word for star. Here's the word um, for constellation used here. And this is the only time you find this word in the Bible. In the Hebrew, Kassil. And Kassil means any notable constellation, specifically Orion, as if a burly one, constellation Orion. So we know the constellation Orion, what? It's a group of stars. It has its own little, you know, I see Orion every night, the way it comes up over my house in the evening, every night, the same way, same place, year after year. Um, so he's talking about the constellation, and constellations are mentioned in the Bible of stars. Um, now here's the Jensenius Hebrew Chaldee goes on to say that this was also um, the Orientals called Orion the giant. It also can mean a fool, um, so a foolish giant in the bound to the sky. But it's just a constellation or a group of stars. But here's some verses that talk about some of the different constellations. Arcturus, that's the great bear, and his three sons. Orion, uh, the Pleiades, the seven stars, and so on. So it mentions them here. And it says, seek him that makes the seven stars in Orion. Don't seek the stars. All right? That's what people are doing with their horoscopes and everything else. So you see... There's a constellation, the Great Bear, Arcturus. Now, you see this, Job 38, 32 talks about, Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Uh, Maseroth is a, is a reference to the, um, to the 12 main constellations of the Zodiac and the 36 associated constellations. So, Mazara is the word in the sense of distinction, some noted constellation. So again, the Bible talks about the stars and talks about concentrations of stars, constellations, right? That's all it is. Um, now here's, just so you know, uh, the King James really mistranslated this right here, this one verse, in a bad way by putting the word planets here. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about planets whatsoever, that there's stars and planets. No, it doesn't talk about that at all. This word, guess what? When he says here, 
This is one of the righteous kings of Israel, of Judah. It says he put down the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places and in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burn incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. But here's the word in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, the word there for planets is Mazalah, the constellation. So it should have been translated constellations, stars, groups of stars, not planets. There is no such thing. There are stars, and then there are the wandering stars. All right. Now let's look at Psalm 104 here, verses 1 through 5. Again, what did he make? Now remember, there are different classes of angels. There are seraphim. There are cherubims. Okay? There are these living creatures and things that we just described. I mean, there are things described in the Bible. You're like, what is that? But there is a class of angels. I think Enoch calls them the luminaries is one word to put it. But God talks about these angels here when he talks about he made them flames of fire or what? Lights. That's why he says Satan can come as an angel of light, right? So let's read this, Psalm 104, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, right? who maketh the clouds his chariot. We'll talk about these clouds in a minute, too. It's not the ones you think. Uh, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Now, he calls his angels in another place ministers, those who will go forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation, right? So the angels are called ministers. But he says here, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. So, he makes it clear his angels are spirits, but they're also like, what? Flaming fire. So there's another reference to the stars. Now here's Job 38, 1 through 7. In the context, this is God speaking to Job in the context of creation. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? I love that. It's so nice and sweet. But he's saying, who's this talking that don't know squat? Right? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Notice God said the foundations of the earth are fastened. Right? It's not moving. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now get this, verse 7, pay close attention. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now here it calls the angels who were, this is during creation, before the creation of man. When God was laying the foundations of the earth. He said that when the, when the uh, morning stars sang together, right? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, wait a minute. Now, God made, said in the beginning, God made the what? The heavens and the earth. So the first thing he did, what? what? So when he's making the heavens and the earth, it says the morning star shouted for glory. Well, wait a minute. I thought the stars were all created on the fourth day. You see what I'm saying? No, they were around here. But God set them. All right? He set them in the firmament. The, this class of them. But again, these are, I believe there were these angels, the sons of God, this, this Benaiah Elohim. All right, we see them mentioned in Genesis 6. But here it is, again, mentioning stars and these angels. Angels referred to as the sons of God as well. So, is this Bible or is this Pastor Dean? All right, just so you understand, it's not me. I'm not making up stuff. This is what it says. Now, Psalm 97 is something we need to, we need to get 
just read this here and just remember. You're going to see this term clouds, and darkness. Look at this. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. What? Clouds and darkness are round about the Lord. Wait a minute. Does the Lord live within our atmosphere and, you know, is it always dark in our atmosphere? Is there always clouds in our atmosphere? No, 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 no. He's talking about something else. So these clouds he's talking about are not the clouds in our sky. You need to understand that. These are not the clouds in our sky, but they are a different set of clouds. We'll show you. He says, clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness. And what's this? All the people see his glory. All right? Again, that's part of that light that has nothing to do with the sun or the moon or the stars. But we'll come to the back to that later on. Now, here's Psalm 18, 9 through 11. What does this say? He bowed the heavens also. This is actually what it's talking about when he bent down the firmament and bent it down, bowed it. means he bent it and made it shape of a dome and made it come down and touch the earth. So he bowed the heavens and came down. And look at this. Darkness was under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, and he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Look at this. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters. What? And thick clouds of the skies. All right? Thick clouds of the skies, darkness, dark waters. God said that's his pavilion. That's where he lives. All right? Shall we keep going? Y'all okay with this? Let me show you. There's a picture of right here. There's a picture of what's called the cave nebula, right? Now, let me ask you something. What do you see here? Because I'm going to tell you what I see. I see stars and a cloud. But what does science see? Somehow they magically see that that's a galaxy. And that's a zoomed in picture with their best telescopes. What do you see? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And there just happens to be an area where there is a cloudy area. Nebula are simply what they call nebula or nebulae or I mean, they get all with their fanciness, right? Nebulae. It's clouds. Yeah, clouds. Just clouds. But now what they're going to tell you is, as they get zoom in on these things, they can tell they're not really clouds. They're galaxies. Bigger than ours. I'm telling you, they'll look at this picture, me and you look at this picture, and we see stars in a cloud, and they see galaxies bigger than our galaxy. Right? Are we looking at the same picture? Yep. Um, I'm going to show you some stuff's going to shock you today. Here's another picture. Here's the, the heart nebula. What does that look like to you, you guys and gals? I see stars. And a cloud, right? But these are the really, really high clouds. Remember this. Remember when Satan, when he was Lucifer in Isaiah 14, he said, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I always wondered what that meant. There's also scripture that talks about God's faithfulness is unto the clouds. Wait a minute. You mean 20,000 feet? And that's where it stops, God's faithfulness? No, there's clouds much higher, much different. I believe these are in the firmament. All right? Why? Because God said that he would hide himself. He would use these clouds, these dark clouds and this darkness 
to hide himself from punks. This is the so-called spiral galaxy. You know what this is? Clusters of stars and a cloud. Right? Let's keep going. There's, there's the one they call the eye of God. Now, why? let me ask you something. Why have I showed you all of these pictures in black and white? Uh, because that's how you see them. Because there's no color to them whatsoever. That's how so-called, we'll get to that, so-called Hubble, which is really Sophia, the telescopes, this is how they see them. This is how the biggest telescopes in the world see them. There's no such thing as color to these things. That is fantasy land. That is NASA artist, as I'm going to show you here. Let's get the volume ready. Are you all ready? Because we've got a series of little videos here. Nothing that you have seen on the Internet about nebula and galaxies, the way they portray it to you is how it actually looks. They are lying to you, and they admit it. So let's watch this first one. In the meantime, they are images that inspire, educate, and sometimes just make us say, wow. Yeah. Over the years, NASA has given us spectacular photos and renderings that reveal a colorful and mysterious universe. No doubt. And now Chris Martinez is introducing us to two of the artists behind some of the most iconic space art in the galaxy. In a small, bright office, working side by side. Let's see. Uh, Robert Hurt and Tim Pyle bring the universe to life. What we're doing does have real science underlying it. Robert is an astrophysicist turned artist. Tim, once a Hollywood animator, is now a planet illustrator. Together, they produce some of NASA's most popular images, from renderings of how planets light years away could look, to actual photos of stars and galaxies captured by NASA's powerful telescopes. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of those images have a dark, grainy start, but color and light reveal an astonishing glimpse of how the deepest regions of space might appear to the human eye. What I'm trying to do is show people sort of the, the broader colors that the universe has to offer. It's a delicate blend of imagination and data. The artists meet with NASA scientists over many drafts to ensure a planet or galaxy's look lines up with the research to make each one as accurate as possible. I love the challenge. It's kind of like a puzzle to me of trying to create something that looks really cool within the restrictions that were given by the scientists. It can take days, even weeks, to produce just a single image. The dazzling final results, enough to keep us all dreaming of the final frontier for years to come. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Pasadena, California. The artists also say they have to be especially careful when it comes to illustrations of other planets to avoid colors many of us would associate with Earth, like blue for water. Okay, notice how he said, this is how it comes to me. Hold on, let's see, did I, did I play that? Let's just listen. Oh, let's back up. Y'all got it on? Here we go. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of those images have a dark, grainy start, but color and light reveal an astonishing glimpse of how the deepest regions of... Let's play that again. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of... Wait, what do you say? Oops. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of those out. images have a dark, uh -huh. rainy start, but color and light reveal well, an I astonishing glimpse for you. of how the deepest <laughs> region. All right, it gets worse. Let's watch this one. I'm a visualization scientist. I basically try to come up with ways of explaining complex science stories through the visuals and developing artwork and illustrations that actually can help explain the science story to people. For decades, popular culture and shows like Star Trek inspired a generation of scientists by envisioning what space might look like. But wait, what does space actually look like? Heart nebulas, celestial collisions, a bird's eye view of the Milky Way, astronomers are charting the outer reaches of the cosmos and bringing back jaw-dropping images from telescopes like Hubble and its infrared cousin Spitzer. If you look down at the bottom of that Milky Way image, you'll see these two words, artist concept. 
This sweeping image of the Orion Nebula actually looks like this. And the TRAPPIST-1 star system, the latest discovery of seven potentially habitable exoplanets that made national headlines, it's really only a box of gray and white pixels. You see, space art is part of NASA, and it has been since before we went to the moon. You may remember our host Amy explored this in a previous episode, and it inspired us to track down the scientist behind some of NASA's most fascinating images. Most space imagery begins with data, very, very complex data. And transforming these numbers and graphs into an image that captures the public's imagination requires a delicate balance between science and art. And that is where Robert comes in. As an astronomer and artist, Robert isn't editing images so much as he's making an artistic hypothesis grounded in facts, so we can visualize what's really happening up there. And for objects we haven't even seen yet, like TRAPPIST-1, the artist rendition is a meticulous process. Once a result shows up, the first thing I'll do is get a copy of the paper and look over it. I just want to understand what is actually being presented as peer-reviewed science. Then usually the next step is to contact the scientists involved in the research directly and discuss with them how we might go about illustrating their result. The first day I saw the data plot of the light curve from the TRAPPIST-1 star, my jaw dropped because it was just a forest of deep dips in the light curve and we knew there was a whole flurry of activity. This data doesn't look like much to the untrained eye, but the depth of the dip reveals the size of the planet. And by studying tiny blips of light as the planets pass the star, otherwise known as the transit method, astronomers can tell that the exoplanets orbit close to their star. All of this information is critical, so Robert can paint the right picture. You can actually figure out how big the planet is, what its surface temperatures would be because of that proximity. You know, this is a really tight, close-in solar system. And so that became an exciting angle that we wanted to take into the graphics as well. This is nothing like our own solar system. To tell a big story like TRAPPIST-1, Robert takes the scientific limitations seriously because the wrong color could be very misleading. Rendering an exoplanet with bright green continents would be kind of crossing a line for us. We don't want to say, hey, we found life on this planet, and showing green really would communicate that. It's enough to show some evidence of water. In fact, a lot of times we've made special efforts to make the water not look super appealing, you know, not like this tropical deep blue appearance, because you would think that complete accuracy would be the goal when you're doing astronomical illustrations, but it isn't always the case. The primary goal is communication and understanding. Communicating space discoveries with art has a long and storied history. One of the fathers of modern space art was the famed Chesley Bonestell, a designer and illustrator. In the 1950s, he created an image of Saturn's moon Titan before Neil Armstrong had ever taken his first steps on the lunar surface. Carl Sagan once famously said of Chesley, I didn't know what other worlds looked like until I saw Bonestell's paintings. His work was so widely acclaimed that his illustrations accompanied articles written by German rocket scientist Werner von Braun, which ultimately inspired the American space program. Many of the things that seem impossible now will become realities tomorrow. Having a visual response to technical triumphs was something NASA latched onto early on. For over 50 years, NASA worked closely with artists and creative leaders like Walt Disney and Norman Rockwell to help shape the stories of spaceflight. It's the same legacy today, just with more advanced scientific understanding and better tools to imagine what far off worlds might look like if we could visit them. We want to take a lot of care to make sure we don't oversell the part of the story that isn't actually the story. There are people who just look and think, oh, NASA's photographed a planet, and they don't understand that actually that was a piece of art. On the other hand, if we don't do that and we don't put a piece of compelling artwork, then people may never even look at the story anyway. We're putting as much science as we can of where we know today. And I like to think that in 50 years when people come back and look at, say, the various pictures of exoplanets after maybe we actually finally know what they look like, they might wink and smile to each other like, oh, that's so funny, and they thought there was water on that one, but also appreciate that this is kind of a historical record of how our understanding of these planets has changed over time. Turns out 50 years later was an overestimate. So much of what we thought we knew about TRAPPIST-1 just changed which means Robert had to go back to the drawing board and quickly redo the artwork for these exoplanets. Robert described the changes during a Facebook Live event, and for him, density was a game changer. For astronomers, you know, we literally know of thousands of exoplanets
This is Spiral Galaxy NGC 3982. What a gorgeous, naturally occurring object in our universe. Well, I mean, it ends up being gorgeous after all this work. And that's true of pretty much every photo you've ever seen of space. They're all photoshopped to perfection. And I'm sure you're wondering why they do it. But the methodology behind how they do it is just as, if not even more interesting than that. Okay, so the most important thing to get out of the way here is that none of these photos are fake. According to the space agencies that took them, they're just interpretations of our reality. These interpretations, however, are edited as NASA, the ESA, the Canadian Space Agency, and most, if not all other space agencies, Photoshop the images they take of the universe around us. Well, I could go on and on and show video after video after video of how none of those colorful pictures that you see of the heart nebula or galaxy or the spiral galaxy or the sombrero galaxy or whatever. None of those things are nothing but stars and clouds. All right. <clears throat> Furthermore, let me say this. They don't know how far or what they are seeing these stars and clouds. They don't know what they're seeing these things through. Now, a lot of them that haven't been to allegedly say they've been to space, cause they just believe what everybody says, that the space is this empty vacuum. We're, we're going to cover that in the next few. What, what is really space? But it's not an empty vacuum here. Now, let's look at this. How did they did come up with these astronomical, and that's their word, distances to these stars when basically we're just seeing lights in the sky, twinkles? dips in brightness and so they came up with this back in the early 1900s um, because they decided that the way light waves work on the earth the way our vision works with what we're going to look at think something called red shift and blue shift that that's how they could determine the distance of these stars and whether they were moving or not moving all right, whether the universe was static still and at rest or whether it was expanding, whether things were moving away or contracting, all based upon how they perceived a little star dimming and coming back brighter and dimming. You know, little kids, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, right? No one knows because all we see, all they see, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, in fact, that what they could see in 1908, they can see no better now. I'm going to show you pictures of the same constellation, cloud, nebula from 1908 versus 2014. No difference. See, this is another place where NASA and the space agencies, the governments of the world, the B system is selling you a bunch of lots, okay? But this guy, Vesto Slifer, what a name there, or Slifer. I don't know how you say it exactly. Anyway, um, he was an American astronomer who performed the first measurements of radial velocities for galaxies. He was the first to discover that distant galaxies are redshifted thus providing the first empirical basis for the expansion of the universe. He was also the first to relate these red shifts to velocity. So I want you to understand that the whole foundation for the Big Bang theory of the universe, the creation of the universe, that the universe is expanding and getting bigger and bigger and things are getting further and further apart and everything's moving, started with this guy who said, I see some red shift. I see something a little different. Again, he's assuming that he's seeing these things through a uh, telescope, and he's assuming that he's seeing these things through the empty vacuum of space, maybe a little bit of our atmosphere. This is what everything is based on, this modern science view of what the stars are. 
or how big the universe is, how far away everything, it's all based on this. You understand? Um, and people just take it in because, oh, these guys are smarter than me, so they must know what they're talking about. All right? Now, here's where it breaks it down a little bit. They use uh, spectroscopy here to investigate the rotation periods of planets and composition of planetary atmospheres. In 1912, he was the first to observe the shift of spectral lines of the galaxies, making him the discoverer of galactic redshifts. I mean, it just gets crazy, right? We, you can read all this for yourself. Edwin Hubble is often incorrectly credited with discovering the redshift of galaxies. These measurements and their significance were understood before 1917 by James Edward Keeler, Vesto Melvin uh, Slipher, uh, so on and so forth. Combining his own measurements of galaxy distances with Vesto Slipher's measurements of the redshifts associated with galaxies, Hubble and Milton Humason discovered a rough prop proportionality of the object's distances with their redshifts. Uh, the, this redshift distant correlation today termed hubble Lamatre's law. Isn't it interesting? They, they don't tell you who he is just yet, Lamatre, right? Law, formerly named as uh, Hubble's law. Um, but anyway, well, this was formulated by Hubble and, and Humason in 1929. It became the basis for the modern model of the expanding universe based on what they thought they were seeing and that this somehow works at those distances the same as it works here, that is an assumption. Can I tell you that you don't base your whole thought of creation on an assumption? But there's a lot of assumptions made, and they build upon one another's assumptions. And basically what this spectroscopy is, is basically analyzing white light, dispersing it with a prism as an example of studying the different types of light and light waves, blah, 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 right? And just so you know, Hubble's law, in, in physical cosmology, Hubble's law, or hubble lemaitre law, objects observed in deep space, extragalactic space, or 10 megaparsecs or more, are found to have a redshift interpreted as a relative velocity away from the Earth. Interpreted. Do you see this? So this is what they base it on. We think... We're seeing a redshift in the light waves. So we think these galaxies, which are just star clusters and clouds, are moving away from us. Therefore, there's an ever-expanding universe. Now, this is what blows me away. And this is an idea here. The wave is, uh, the wavelengths, they say, get longer redshift as something is moving away from you versus something moving toward you, it blue shifts, it contracts, and so it changes the light wave color. So that's what they're talking about. So again, whether these things are true or not upon the earth, let's say they're true here, or they're true, but are they true if they're looking at stuff that's embedded in some kind of molten crystal glass or above that glass in the water that's above the firmament? I do know this, that light changes as it passes through different mediums, like glass, like water. So again, but this is what I say. I say God's allowing them to see what they want to see or to interpret it the way they want to interpret it and to let the stars deceive them because they don't want to believe him. They don't want to believe his word because then that would make them accountable to his laws, his commandments, his morality, and they don't want any of that. Um, and this just tells you what redshift is. I think you guys understand it now. You can look it up. I find this very interesting that one of the first to present this whole idea of the Big Bang expanding universe that contradicts what the Bible says the way it happened was a Jesuit priest by the name of George Henry Joseph Edward Lemaitre, or Lemaitre, I don't know how you say it, whatever. Uh, my three years of French are pretty much gone. Um, he was a Jesuit-educated Belgian Catholic priest, mathematician, astronomer, professor of physics at the Catholic University of Louvain. He was the first to identify that the recession of nearby galaxies can be explained by the theory of an expanding universe, which was observationally confirmed soon afterwards by Edwin Hubble. 
He was the first to derive what is known as Hubble's Law. Um, blah, blah, blah. He became, Lemaitre also proposed later and became known as the Big Bang Theory of the Origin of the Universe. Okay? Now, how does a Catholic priest give you a theory that's contrary to the Bible? I thought they, Catholics were Christians. Nope. Let's keep going here. Now we're going to look at jump to this Mount Wilson Observatory. Why? This is very important here as we study the stars. And look, we're not even an hour into this, so we're doing good. I'm moving through it. Mount Wilson Observatory there. Uh, where is this? Uh, California. I think it's near Los Angeles somewhere. This was built in the early 1900s. The first phase, I think, was 1908. And then 1917. Um, here it is, Mount Wilson Observatory is Los Angeles area facility with several telescopes. Um, one of the says the most notable discovery in the 1920s when Ebel, uh, Edwin Hubble used the photographic plates from this 100 inch telescope to discover that the Andromeda galaxy is a galaxy in its own right. That basically, that these spiral, you know, it says previously the galaxies and others like it was believed to be spiral nebulas or clouds within the reach of the Milky Way. So all of a sudden, Hubble, looking at these dots and clouds through this telescope, decides they're galaxies. So now we have a new thing. Does the Bible say God created galaxies? Yeah. Does it say he made stars and clouds? Yep. All right. Come on, Christians. Quit believing these people. Uh, Mount Wilson Observatory was founded in 1904 by George Ellery Hale, a pioneer in the field of astrophysics. Also, had some weird occult connections. Um, well, I'm going to play a video for you in a second. He's, he studied the chemical and physical processes of the stars according to the observatory's website. Hale began to work on the mountaintop with the Snow Solar Telescope, which was moved to Mount Wilson from Yerkes or Yerkes. Observatory in Wisconsin, where Hale used to work. Now, um, I want you to see this because this big, huge telescope was pretty much financed in that time period by the Carnegie Institution. <laughs> Your Illuminati boys were behind all this. That's my point. All right, let's let's hear a little bit about this from Mr. About Mr. Hale and his little green elves that would come help him, literally. Little green people. Entities. Long prone to bouts of depression, Hale's worries about the project begin to affect his health. Later on, he admitted that he had been uh, visited by a, a companion, uh, sort of described as a little green elf who might come to his bed or sit on his shoulder, perhaps to give him advice about how to run his life, uh, how to raise money, who to talk to. It's, it's hard to say. The elf perhaps helped him work out some of this stress. Whatever it is that carries Hale through, on November 2nd, 1917, the 100 inch telescope is finished. Its 100 tons of iron and steel move with the precision of a fine watch. Its 9,000 pound mirror can detect a candle 5,000 miles away. What Hale has built is one of the marvels of the 20th century. It will reign for decades as the best telescope in the world and prove beyond doubt the worth of big telescopes. To spend a night here is the dream of astronomers the world over. You would open the dome, a kind of rolling like thunder, and you were alone on the mountain with a telescope. It's just you and the universe, or you and God, so to speak. You'd sit at the platform of the telescope, 
guiding, making very fine adjustments on this magnificent instrument with a little hand paddle with your eye staring down onto the illuminated crosshairs and work there 8, 10, 12 hours. Oftentimes it was extremely cold. In winter they wore heavy coats, sometimes they were bearskin or sheepskin coats. Uh, you could literally have your tears freeze to the eyepiece and they wanted hot coffee but Hale wouldn't allow it. He thought it was poisonous to the system. Coffee isn't all that Hale keeps off the mountaintop. In the 1920s, I would not have been allowed to work up here. In fact, I wouldn't have been welcome even as a wife or a visitor of any of the scientists. Hale, in his days at Yerkes, had found that the wives of some of the astronomers became a distraction to their monastic scholarly studies, and so they were essentially banned from the mountaintop. Ironically, without the contribution made by a woman, the first great discovery made with the 100-inch might not have been possible. The closest a woman could get to the field was at the time at the Harvard College Observatory, where major data collecting projects were in progress. Women were hired on to help to analyze the data, to do all the menial tasks that were below the duties of the men. Henrietta Leavitt is one of a dozen women who study tens of thousands of photographic plates taken by men at distant observatories. Levitt's task is to examine plates taken at different times and look for stars that vary in brightness. She notices a pattern in one class of stars called Cepheids and realizes the time it takes them to reach their maximum brightness can be used to determine how far away they are. It's a landmark discovery. Before Levitt, astronomers couldn't calculate the distance to any but the closest stars. What Henrietta Levitt did was provide one of the first, and still to this day, one of the most fundamental yardsticks in the universe. It is the measure by which all distances are determined. Without that, we'd be clueless. Oh, oh, it's almost laughable. Uh, okay, so this woman, Levitt, is, she's studying these plates, and these plates are primitive, you understand. And so she decides that there's a star they call Cepheids, right, that brightens and dims, meaning it twinkles at, you know, a constant interval, and then somehow magically, by that, we can determine the distance to these stars. And you heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say, this is the yardstick. This is the yardstick still to this day. Without this, we would be clueless. I got news for you, Neil. You're still clueless. Because the brightness of a star, the twinkle of a star, does not tell you how far it is away. You do not know that. No one knows that. There's no frame of reference. We know that people have been wrong on the distance of the sun over and over and over and over again. And we know now it's not 93 million miles of the way. They can't even get the sun. And it's our supposed to be our star, the closest star to us. And they don't know the distance that. One point it was 6 million. Another was 12 million. Then it was 18 million. Now it's 93 million. No, it's in our atmosphere. All right, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to prove that next week, probably. All right, but the bottom line is, think about this. This is modern science basing everything on what this woman said about a pho photographic plate of twinkle, twinkle little star. And they have come up with, okay, because that star brightens and dims a certain way, that means it's 400 thousand light years away what do you understand that they are pulling this stuff out of some place unpleasant why because they don't want to believe god's word and they don't want to believe what we actually observe 
Now, I want to show you just a few more things here. Look at this. Okay. Notice it says this. Astronomers used this 60-inch telescope scope in studies that led to the classification of stars by their light spectrum. Again, how we perceive the light spectrum of these stars, not taking into account what we may be seeing them through or anything, not having any knowledge of that, throwing out the idea that there's a firmament, throwing out the idea that there's the ether, they decide just because of we see certain light spectrum coming from these stars, we can determine their distances. That's just baloney. It's just arbitrary. It's just this is what we want to assume. But this became the foundation of astronomy to this day. Okay? So you need to understand that. That's why I entitled this Deceived by the Stars. Now I want to show you something. Here, these astronomical plates made history. I want to show you a few of these plates just real quick. And then we're going to get to, we're almost to the end, believe it or not. But anyway, this was, uh, it says, on a clear Christmas morning atop Mount Wilson before the first tentacles of the dawn struck the Los Angeles sprawl 5,700 feet below. George Willis Ritchie was capturing the most spectacular view of the great nebula of Orion. So remember that. This is in, what did it say? Um, 1908, I think it was here. Let's look at that. So this is the picture. Yeah, this is Richie's picture with the Mount Wilson telescope in 1908. Now, what do you see? Please tell me what you see. Clouds and what? Stars. Now, this is the best telescope they had. And it was the best telescope in the world for what? Decades, it said. And this is the best picture they can get. And it's still twinkle, twinkle, little star, and clouds. That's the Orion Nebula there, right? 1908. Let's keep going. Here's a few other plates. This is Edwin Hubble's famous uh, variant star revelation after observing the Andromeda Nebula using the 100-inch hooker. So he has this, listen to this, Edwin Hubble that we based the whole Big Bang Theory and Expanding Universe on, he based it on because he saw a star do something different. He saw a star do something different, a variant star. And he has this revelation. Now, he was a weird dude anyway. I won't even tell you how weird he is. W today, we would probably lock him up at a mental institution. Um, but this is what, that, that's the plate it was based on. Um, we can keep going here. Uh, this one, this image, now look at this image. This is supposed to be an image of the, of the sun, the sun's magnetic field captured by George Ellery Hale using the Snow Solar Telescope at Mount Wilson, 1908. Now, I don't know how you figured that out. It's amazing these little grainy black and white pictures, they can figure out some, just like, did y'all see, remember a minute ago, the Trappist system, right, the new solar system they found? Very bad pixelated squares. But they somehow know what they're made of, if there's water on them, if they're rock, how dense they are, the temperature they are. It's unbelievable. Ah, uh, here's another one. Their first confirmation of a magnetic field beyond the Earth. Okay. If you say so. All right, let's keep going. Now, here's, here's something I want you to see right here. The late astronomer Houghton Chip Arp is best known for his 1966 atlas of a peculiar atlas of peculiar galaxies for which he photographed hundreds of galaxy, galaxies with strange shapes and behaviors among these was Stefan's quintet five closely interacting galaxies undergoing violent collisions as far away as 300 million light years and one remarkable shot taken five years after atlas publication at polymer observatory in san diego he identified a supernova and labeled it sn in the right image, which had exploded a month before. The other arrows on this plate point to the reference stars. So, so this guy's claiming he saw a supernova. Uh, ARP used this to calculate the supernova's coordinates in space uh, from an earlier shot left taken in 1964. This brilliant blast is noticeably absent. Now, I want you to see. 
here's the 1964 shot. Here's the 1971 shot. I see a few little dots up here and there. A star appeared, a light appeared. Oh, it's a supernova, and it's 300 mile light years away, and come on, y'all. I can t tell more convincing fairy tales to my daughter at night than this. What do you see? Oh, but you don't have the untrained eye. You don't know what that dot is. I know what that dot is because I'm an astronomer. I know what that dot that's not there, I know what it is. That's a star that exploded. It's a superstar, supernova. We know exactly how far away it is. No, you don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at there. Look at that. This is why I say they've been deceived by the stars. I think, they say, how are we going to deceive them? How are you going to deceive them, angel stars? Oh, I'm going to go and just turn my light on. <laughs> and they're going to go, oh, look at my new God. Here's a plate. I guess it broke partially. Of course, this is a negative, right? So you see the, uh, anyway. So they, they determined with this little picture plate here that um, there was hot stars and cold stars. and It's just ridiculous. It's just, it's ridiculous. Now, I, I'm going to zoom on through this. Here, here we go. Now, this was Edwin Hubble's image, this right here. All right, let's read this one. Ed, Edwin Hubble devoted... Much of the study of the observation of the Andromeda, um, which is really just a cloud and concentration, so it's really just a constellation and some clouds, but he called it a galaxy. He changed it. Uh, this was made, this picture right here was made using the 100 inch Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson Observatory in 1924. So you see that picture right there, 1924. Do you see anything that would stand out to you as significant? No. But boy, they do. We'll just keep going. Yeah, see, this is, this is what they're looking at. Plates with dots on them. But they know everything about those little dots. Now, let's keep going. Now, here's some modern... You, you can go. This is a... I, I looked up this video and then I went to the page myself. So you can go and you can look up all of these alleged photos from the Hubble telescope, right? Just There's just page after page after page after page. Um, and they're all in black and white. There's no such thing as color. Hubble hasn't sent you one color picture, right? I should say Sophia, not Hubble, but we'll get to that in a second. Here's a picture. Now, you know what this video is? This is a woman here that works for NASA or JPL or one of these things. But anyway, she takes these photos, these shots from the Hubble telescope that are the same thing as we've seen from these other telescopes, and she photoshops them to pieces, okay, and puts in color and takes out stuff she doesn't like. And then those pieces get put on websites and articles, right? What do you see there? there there's a Hubble shot, right? This is her working in Photoshop with this, trying to make it look pretty, trying to enhance it for you, try, bringing color into it, all right? These are shots from Hubble. Hubble, Spitzer. What, what do y'all see here? Lights in the sky. And not very good ones. All right. Now, this picture should be the most incriminating one of all. This is a comparison. This is an alleged shot from Hubble Telescope 
right, of the Orion Nebula, cloud and stars. This is 2014. This is supposed to be from something in space. And then you've got this telescope over here sitting on a mountain near Los Angeles. 1908, 2014. What do you see? Do you see these colorful green and pink and purple? And no, but see, well, everybody believes that these pictures they're seeing are somehow different than what they had back then. There's no difference. In fact, this one looks better. The Mount Wilson picture looks better than the alleged Hubble telescope that's in, supposed to be in outer space and have no interference from our atmosphere or humidity or air and gas. It's somehow around the earth. Do y'all see that? No, they're just stars. And there's clouds. And these are the high stars and the high clouds that Satan wants to ascend over. This is supposed to be the discovery deploying Hubble. Um, who took that picture? Yeah, where are the stars? This is a fake picture, brother. It's just totally fake. Actually, it's animation. But this is said to be a picture taken by the discovery of Hubble in space. I guess you can't see stars in space where there's no interference from an atmosphere. No, this is an aluminum foil model that they built. I can't get into why. There's, there's Spitzer, which is supposed to be the infrared... Um, telescope that they've put in space. Looks like a fancy trash can to me. I, I, yeah, it's a smoker. That's, that's right. That's a smoker. That's what I would use it for. Right? So the Spitzer is an infrared, says an infrared space telescope um, that it was launched in 2002, ret retired January 30, 2020, because it, it can't cool itself anymore. And so, right, so it's gone. And I, and, but let me, let me just share something with you. They have this thing right here called Sophia, all right, which is a 747 built in with a telescope. All right, and so-called supposed to be an in infrared telescope as well. There it is. Got multiple pictures of this. I just want to show you this stratospheric observatory. Now, first of all, why do you need this? Something flying around in our atmosphere if you have Hubble and Spitzer. Why do you spend billions on this? Or maybe the money that went to Hubble and Spitzer really went to this, and they built a couple of trash cans for you to look at. But this is really the observatory. See there? Look at this thing. This is mammoth. This is inside the 747. Look at that. Here's some pictures. Here's some pictures from Sophia. Let me ask you something here. Does that look any different than anything else we've seen? Now, before we get into this, let me just say this, because I'm at the end. I did this quick. This is really quick. Let me say this. There was a guy, and I listened to him last night, and I was recording his video. I wish he didn't use the language that he uses, because so I, I would have to beep, 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 beep. But anyway, this guy, he's a fellow flat earther, and he did this thing where he called NASA 
in back in around 2016 or 17, somewhere in that time period. And he actually, this guy's a smart guy. I mean, he's a really smart guy. And he actually got someone, uh, one of the program or uh, managers of NASA, of the Hubble, and started asking this guy questions. Like, how long have you been the program, one of the program directors of Hubble? 25 years. Have you ever seen it with your own eyes? No. No. Do you have any assets like the ISS? Have you ever put a camera from the ISS on the Hubble, zoomed in on it, and videoed that? No. He talked about the... Um, what is the website? The uh, F, what is it? Yeah, FAI website where NASA is part of this thing and they upload all the data to these launches, right? Hubble was allegedly the heaviest launch NASA ever pulled off, right? And on this website where they put, they even, they even have the data for the so-called uh, missions to service Hubble, but they don't have any of the data, not one piece, not one stitch of the actual mission to put Hubble in alleged space. Then he started talking to him about that he had done the math, and if Hubble was inserted at 330 miles, as it is stated, that it's been up there for about, at this point, 29 years, 30 years, that its orbit should have degraded to a certain place, which would basically put it in the same area of the ISS, and why have they not videoed that from the ISS? And the guy said, I don't know. He goes, now wait a minute, aren't you a program director for Hubble, what do you know? And this guy started talking about, I was in the military, and if we had a, if we had a high priority asset somewhere, we had eyes on it. He goes, there's nothing on the ground. He said, there's no gr nothing on the ground. There's none of your telescopes that are here on the ground. Can zoom in and find Hubble? Nope. Y'all have never done that. See, here's my point. Oh, I mean, there's a recording of this phone call. I mean, he, he shows where he calls, and he says, thank you for calling NASA such and such headquarters in Maryland. Da, 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 da. He went through, he had to go through, like, several people because no one was there. And I think he got to his fourth person before he found somebody. I was shocked. And this guy basically proved there's no such thing as Hubble. Why? Because there's nothing outside the firmament. There is no outer space as we've been taught. And biblically, we know that to be true. God made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. He made the firmament. He placed the stars in the firmament. They're attached, obviously, because Jesus said they're going to be shaken loose. They're not massive suns and galaxies far, far away because they're going to fall to earth. There's no planets, there's constellations and clouds. There are clouds in our atmosphere and there are clouds very high up. And God said that he, he surrounded himself with these clouds and with this darkness. So why does it get dark up there? Because he made it dark. Why are there clouds? Because he made clouds to hide himself, he said. He made stars. And he said the stars are and guess what? He said some of the stars, and this is something I'll cover, I'll talk about next week. Some of the stars obey him and have continued their course and their operations, and some stars rebelled against him. And those are the stars, I believe, deceiving these men and women who think that because a star dims, that there's a sun and a planet out there. It's deception. The Big Bang Theory, 
is a deception. It's, it's, it's as much a deception as evolution, that we came from monkeys, that we crawled out of some primordial goo and as some little, some little tadpole. And then we somehow developed legs in the muddy goo. And then we somehow, you know, eventually became, you know, primates and then eventually became human beings. And yet they find none of these transitions in any fossil record that's ever existed. You know what, this, this whole thing about how they've built this whole construct with so-called twinkling stars and red and blue shift and all these little optical illusions, and they built this. I remember studying evolution years ago, and I remember they, they, they found this tooth, and they thought it was the tooth of one of our ancient ancestors, like the missing link. And they built this big thing, this big thing out of this tooth. And it was Neanderthal man or Piltdown man or something like that, out of a tooth, right? And then as technology increased and they were able to do a DNA test on the tooth, they found out that it was the tooth of an extinct pig. And this is what they have done with this whole nonsense of the stars and distant galaxies and planets and exoplanets and systems. But listen, all of this is part of a lie to get you to believe that there's so many other galaxies and stars and suns and planets that there has to be, has to be life out there. There has to be aliens out there. Oh, there's aliens out there, all right. They're called fallen angels and demons. And they're going to come and peek in on these guys like the little elf that came to Mr. Hale. Build your satellite and we'll, we'll construct something from a twinkle. Just build it. Build it and they will come. Right? And see, let me tell you something. I'll be criticized. My wife is a witness. Babe, when, when we met, we met in 2008 in, uh, in uh, what was, we actually met in March of 2008, the first time, or February we talked, March, but we got married the end of 2008. But in 2007, God, began, I know God was leading me to study this, because I started studying this stuff back then. This is before my eyes were open to the true biblical cosmology and creation, but God was leading me to study what they believed. I've studied all this about, I was talking to her on one, our first date about, about dark matter, dark energy, red shift, blue shift, that I was studying all this stuff. 2007, I was studying this stuff. Now I know that it's as foolish as evolution. It's foolishness. And people, people are in love with the idea of space and planets and aliens and galaxies and space travel and thanks to Disney and Hollywood and, and the branch of Hollywood called NASA who hires Hollywood illustrators. It's all to lead people away from the truth of this book and that Jesus, that this book also leads you to not only know the nature of creation, the truth about it, but it leads you to the true creator, the savior, the redeemer, the one who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. And see, people, I have Christians all the time, what does it matter? Let me tell you why, why all this matters. Because many, 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 many people have believed these lies about space, and galaxies, and orbiting, and spinning, and flying, and aliens, and life on other planets. And they believed all these lies, and they've thrown the Bible out the door. And they're atheists, or they're agnostics, or they're New Agers, or they're into the occult. And that's why, since 2014, when this truth came out, that the earth really is flat that it is still in at rest, like the Bible said. That there's no way. They, listen, listen, I, I'm going to play it next week. But I got it confirmed 
that a Russian cosmonaut, a well-known Russian cosmonaut, has stated they did not go to space like you've been told. We're going to find out what space is next week, and what the ether is, and where they do go, because they do go up there. Well, I'm going to tell you where they go and how it works. In fact, the Bible talks about them making a nest in the stars. They've made them a little nest up there. It's just on a balloon. And we'll talk about that next week. All right? Let's stand. And I want to say this as we close this morning. If you're listening to me today, you need to know, is there, is there real science? Yes. Is there real technology? Yes. Is there pseudoscience and theory? Yes. See, there's fairy tales. And God told us through, you know, the Apostle Paul, Holy Spirit, through him, speaking to Timothy, said, you know, there will come a time when people will not listen to the truth of the scriptures, but they will be turned to fables, myths. These are myths. Myth. There's, there, there's no terra firma out there flying around, floating by, called Pluto. No. Now, there's something out there moving by. It's just another light shaped in a certain way, but it's not Pluto. They're not landing on anything. It's even questionable whether the moon's even solid. We'll talk about that, too. Scientists in the 60s thought it was plasma. I'll tell you what, it sure looks funky to me. You can see through it sometimes, right? As somebody pointed out this morning, if it's 240,000 miles away, how's there blue sky behind it? I don't know. Guess outer space is blue now, along with our atmosphere. I don't know. But we're, we're going to break it all down. Listen, the truth is setting people free. I'm getting testimonies all the time, every week. Got some this week. And people getting saved or getting coming back to the Lord, their doubts being removed. Because of the truth of this book. Look, the angels, God made a certain class of angels. He made them flames of fire. And it says he set them in their courses in their place. And some have remained in their place for all these thousands of years like Polaris never moves. And some of them have become the wandering stars. They have rebelled. They have disobeyed their orbits and courses and directions. And it's the stars that move, not the earth, by the way. All right? And we'll talk about all that next week. But let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you today, and I thank you, Lord, for your word, and I thank you for the truth. God, forgive us all for the times we believe some of this nonsense that we have believed lying, deceiving men and women over your word and over the truth of what we actually see. We've let them tell us what we really should be seeing instead of what we see. And we've let them just make up stuff, and we've believed it as truth. Well, Lord, I thank you that you have revealed the truth to us, Lord, through your word and through just taking some time to examine even their presentations. Their so-called evidence, Lord, we can examine it and we can see that it's foolishness. And that's what you said, Lord, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with you. But that you're going to allow some of them who don't love the truth to be deceived. And so, Lord, we understand we live in a world of deceived men and women, some of which you're permitting, you're allowing them to be deceived because they have chosen not to love you and to love the truth. They're liars, they're deceivers, they're greedy. Some of them are serving Satan and know it, so they're part of the agenda and the plan. But Lord, we know the truth, and the truth has set us free. And I thank you, Lord, we will no longer be deceived by the stars or what they try to tell us about them. So Lord, I ask you to touch every one of your people here today, those watching and listening, especially those who don't know Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that you will quicken their hearts, that they can trust the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 
that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who died for their sins and the only way for their sins to be forgiven and their guilt to be removed and them to be in right standing with you is to believe that you died for their sins, shed your sinless blood and that you rose from the dead and turn to you and turn from wickedness and sin and follow you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, I pray you will make that real to people who have been deceived by the priest of false science. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Y'all know the rule around here. Hug some necks before you leave.